Greetings, AP Calc BC students, and welcome back to session two for our AP Live Daily Review 2022. I just found out that rhymes. That sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? It's always a pleasure to be joining you with my good friend Brian Passwater, and the purpose of this particular video is going to be focusing on some differential equations. We know that you guys have been working really hard, and we want to work hard with you here over the next 45 to 50 minutes or so, and get you guys really feeling comfortable about a extremely important topic. It occupies an entire unit, unit seven of the course and exam description. We've got lots of really good problems for you to take a good look at. As always, I'm joined by one of my good friends, a great AP calculus teacher, one of the best that there is, Mr. Brian Passwater. Brian, how are you doing? Tony, I'm doing pretty well. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm feeling good. I'm excited because we got like about a couple weeks left, right? Two weeks or so until the official AP exams begin, uh, maybe an extra week until the calc exam begins. And we're right at that crunch time where we can start putting things together. And, and for our students who are watching today, hopefully you watched our session uh, yesterday, session one on this integration techniques. Uh, and then we're looking at some differential equations today, but uh, no matter where you are, how comfortable you feel, uh, these eight videos hopefully uh, will give you the confidence uh, that you need uh, to support you as your as kind of come alongside your teachers and all the hard work they've been doing and all the hard work you've been doing this year, uh, that we can be that last little boost uh, across the finish line to a great AP exam score. And in case you don't know who we are, I, of course, Brian Passwater is a, a teacher at Speedway High School. You've probably heard of a really big racetrack that's like just uh, just walking distance pretty much from his his, his school. Uh, I, and Brian, I heard that you can even hear the cars, right? You can even we hear can, the cars. As the race gets ready to start each spring, we can hear them outside. And then I'm Tony Record, and I teach uh, just uh, not too far from Brian at a uh, school uh, west of Indianapolis at Avon High School. So what are we learning? Well, as I said before, we're going to be talking a lot about differential equations. And there's, there's sort of a, a two-fold type of process involved here. You've got some differential equation information that, let's say, would live on the A, B sides. The students that are taking only the A, B exam might focus on the law of natural growth and decay, that the dy over dt is equal to k times y. Maybe a, a problem that deals with something along the lines of Newton's law of cooling. You don't have to worry about specifically being asked to do a problem like that. It's not explicitly going to be tested, uh, but they could present that scenario to you that has a problem that looks a little bit like that. But more so on the BC side, what we're going to probably pay a little bit more attention to in the video, it's going to be the logistic differential equation, which has a lot more, I guess, real life connection because a lot of things in the world will grow logistically and have this kind of carrying capacity. Now, I don't want to read through all uh, six of these bulletin uh, points here. You guys have access to the document uh, that you can find uh, on the uh, particular website uh, uh, that houses all of our documents. And uh, we're going to be referring to this table as time goes on through this particular uh, lesson. And uh, I think what we're going to do here is kind of uh, allow you to see where these topics line up in the AP classroom. Unit 7 is pretty much where they're all housed. And then uh, we'll start doing a little bit of practice. Well, Brian, what do you say? Take over. Wonderful. So yeah, we're going to jump right into it so we can get through a lot of these problems. And um, we're doing differential equations, but like Tony mentioned, the, the two things in this unit that will be sort of BC only topics that separates BC from AB are going to be uh, Euler's method and logistic differential equations. And so uh, we're going to cover everything, hopefully from unit seven, like the big ideas, but we're going to, you know, kind of have a heavier feature toward these BC unique topics. So that way you have a lot of uh, chances to experience them and uh, get more comfortable with them. So uh, the first multiple choice practice this question here is uh, which of the following is a logistic differential equation and so this has actually appeared on the exam quite often you know over the years uh, just a recognition type of problem and knowing what this is and so um, we put an AP level two and if you weren't in our session yesterday uh, we want to clarify what this means and this is Tony and I uh, through our you know years of, of teaching and grading exams and writing questions um, you kind of get a feel and intuition of the, what separates a student from getting a three on the exam versus a four and versus a five. And so the levels you put on there are not college board official in any way. Uh, they're just our interpretations uh, of what these are uh, levels are. So AP level two would be, uh, this is a 
question that you would have to be able to do to get up to a level, you know, AP score of two on the exam. And uh, hopefully that's not our goal is to get a two, but uh, we're going to see level threes, fours, and fives. So you can sort of see where those separations are and what separates these questions. Uh, so AP level two is more of like a very beginning question. Uh, we don't see many of these in our presentations, but we want to include a couple of them at least uh, so we can practice them. So this one is which one of the following is a, uh, a differential, a logistic differential equation. And I have this extra slide here or this extra handout, um, this box here, right? This dy over dt equals ky uh, times one minus y over L. This was on that intro, uh, that intro slide, right? Uh, that Tony shared uh, It's one of the forms of our logistic. And, and knowing these forms is really important because you know, if you had just written that down and copied it, uh, it'd be really easy to check which one is logistic. And so um, there's a couple forms that e equations might appear with, but this is one of the main forms. And uh, what's really important to note about logistic is you will not see the independent variable in the equation. You know, so if it's dy over dx, you will not see the x at all, right? It's only the dependent variable, which is y uh, in this case, right? And so with logistic, uh, not only are you going to see only y or whatever that uh, dependent variable is, it's going to be in there twice somehow. And so if you recognize the form here, it's like the factored form, uh, K times Y, some constant, and then one minus Y over L, and L will be our carrying capacity later on. So, and look at the choices, uh, you know, we have here, at least we have a, a Y here and a Y here, so it's, it's a contender, right? Whereas on choice B, uh, we only have one of those dependent variables. So we know that's not going to be uh, one of our logistics. Whereas on, on C, again, we have that Q in front and on top. And, we, and we're using the different letters because a lot of times these problems are going to be contextual, real world story problems. And so it's good to know, uh, the, the, you know that you might not just see Y and X all the time, right? So this is a good contender. And then the last one, it kind of is a contender, but notice it has the W squared inside instead of W. So that's why it's not going to work. And so we're really down to just A and C. And another big uh, piece of this logistic equation is it's going to be one minus this value. And so here, uh, if we have something like one plus, uh, that's not going to work. We're going to go with choice C in this case. So just recognizing the form. Uh, and then it's always helpful to write those things down as you're comparing. Don't try to compare them just in your head and, and imagine it. If you see it on paper, you can compare much easier. So uh, that's our first question. Uh, we're going to kick it off with another one here. And this one is another kind of AP level two. But uh, the more I think about it, um, it really does feel a little bit more challenging. Like I was working through these problems before and realized I think I might have made a mistake at first. And um, I think this is certainly going to be a, a pretty tough question. And so which of the following equations is not separable? So the AP exam, whether you're in Calc AB or Calc BC, if they ask you to solve a differential equation, it has to be separable. There's a whole course called differential equations you can take uh, in college and you learn all kinds of, you know, different equations that are non-separable and techniques to solving them. But what we have is separable. And what does that mean? Separable means you can separate the variables on each side of the equation by only multiplying or dividing. That's always the big key. You can multiply, you can divide. You cannot add things, you cannot subtract things. It has to be through multiplication and division alone. And so uh, looking at option A, it doesn't seem like we could separate it. We have you know, two different Xs and it's attached to the Y and, and maybe we don't realize we can separate those very easily, uh, but we realize on the right-hand side, you can factor out an X. So I could write this as three Y minus one times X. And so once I've done this, it does become separable because I can, you know, basically go ahead and multiply the, the DX over to the right hand side and I can divide by that quantity 3Y minus 1 and that's separated, right? We've got our X's and DX on the right and our Y's and DY on the left. So that is separable. Uh, B is another example where it's like, how am I going to separate these, right? Uh, because it's no way to break up those X and Y's, but it turns out we can uh, using some properties of exponents that uh, I could break up this into E to the X times E to the negative 2Y. And my own students always are kind of perplexed or I uh, think I'm doing some kind of math magic when I do this at first, because you know this rule. If I had given you this to begin with, and I said combine them, you would automatically, hopefully, know to add up those exponents, right? You know, X squared times X to the fourth, you can combine it into one by adding exponents um, and it would be X minus two Y when you combine them. But we don't think about it in reverse very much. And so uh, it's a little bit hard to see at first, but we were able to separate these. And from here, uh, we can pretty quickly uh, divide by that E to the negative two Y and then put the E to the X 
dx on the right hand side and we do have our nice separation so that one also worked c is looking a little bit tougher for me because you have x and y again like we had on the first couple but uh, i don't have a way to factor it um you know, our first instinct for students a lot is to add x to the left hand side that's what students want to do or subtract 3y to the left hand side but remember when you're separating you're only allowed to multiply and divide so there's no way to break these variables up on this problem unfortunately so i'm, I'm leaning towards c but we can double check on on, on part d's to make sure that it's uh I'm not missing anything and so uh, part D would be pretty simple to just multiply by uh, this quantity uh, y minus one on the left hand side and then uh, keep the sign of 2x plus three on the right hand side and then we can just multiply by that dx and it's separated pretty easily so uh, all of those a b and d separate but uh, part c is the only one that doesn't uh, separate so that would be our choice on that one so some of these problems I think are, are tricky in the sense of you're so used to getting questions that just ask you uh, to do a problem, right? Solve something, a computation, and you can jump right into it and do it. And then some of these problems, there is no direct method. You can't just solve the, the question and find your answer. You have to go through the answers one by one and compare them. And uh, we have to be prepared to do that. Uh, we'll see another example of that later on with these questions. So Tony is going to continue this and take us through some different types of problems and uh, show him some more challenging ones as well. Sounds like a plan, Brian. Let's do just that. And I think what we what I, we should do right here is probably go ahead and take a moment to make sure you all know where you can find the materials here. So we have both a QR code that you could scan, and this is the URL that you can access all the materials uh, for this particular presentation. We'll make sure that you see this again. You can take a quick screenshot of that if you want to pause the video. But this is where you get all of the good stuff. Let's take a look at number three now. We haven't talked uh, quite a lot about this method that we're going to uh, introduce here to you, or probably just review with you, because it's probably pretty likely that you've seen Euler's method. It says, consider the differential equation dy over dx as x plus 2y, where y is equal to f of x. And that's going to be the particular solution through the point 2, 3. Starting at x equal 2, which of the following would give the correct setup for the first step of Euler's method when approximating f of one with two steps of equal size. Brian and I feel like if you just put a little bit of practice into Euler's method, you should be able to plow through these on the AP Calc BC exam. And Brian and I are gonna show you a couple of different methods that you can use to solve these problems. I'll tell students occasionally to use the point slope formula approach. You, you know that you're always gonna be starting with a point for these problems. The derivative that they give you is gonna serve as your slope and through that, you can write the equation of a line, because really that's what Euler's method is about, using linear approximations to meander through this particular curve. And so we see that our initial point is going to be 2, 3 in the question. We're starting at, of course, x equal 2. We have to think about what the slope is going to be at that particular stage. Well, the derivative right here is going to be our slope. We know that from the early stages of the course. So two plus two times three, which of course would be two plus six or eight. And now you can use a tool that has been in your math toolbox now for several years, the point slope formula that you would use to write an equation of a line given a point and a slope, so aptly named. Now, as a formality, because Euler's method is a bit of an iterative process and you might be writing equations of lines over and over again, it's never a bad idea to kind of label that that's my first line. So maybe I can give them subscripts of one just to kind of keep things uh, on, on track. But you notice that the problem says, now which of the following would we give the correct setup of the first step if we were gonna go to approximate one with two equal steps? Now, what that means is we're going to have to put the old car in reverse here, right? We're starting at x equal 2. We need to get to x equal 1 with two equal sizes, two equal, uh, two steps of equal size means that we're going to have to be at one and a half for our next x value. Now, the problem there is we don't quite know what the y value is going to be. And we need that in order to kind of continue on with this slope. And that's where our equation here is going to lie. What we would find when we plug three halves into our previous line is going to give us 
that very equation. And so really there's like another column here that I sometimes tell my students just call it the new Y. And so if I allow that X1 to be three halves, Y1 minus three would be eight quantity, three halves minus two, which is just negative one half. And then I won't even write over the fact that we just need to add a three to the right side to start isolating our Y1. And you can see before very long that B is going to match that particular equation. And then you would continue with Euler's method. I think later on in the broadcast, we're gonna see a, an Euler's method from start to finish with a slightly different approach there. Taking a look at part, uh, problem four of our multiple choice. Uh, slope fields have a very, uh, no pun intended, integral part of this calculus experience with differential equations. And in this particular problem, you're gonna be asked uh, to find which of the following differential equations would model that slope field. And there's a variety of ways that you could organize your work here. Um, one of the methods that I find somewhat helpful for my students, I call it the corner method. In other words, I will go to the corners of this graph. Now it's a little hard to see here, but we have an X value of 10 and a Y value of 10 that lies on our outer extremities. And so I could probably call that ordered pair right there, 10 comma 10. And so I could organize maybe another chart here right next to my, op, my uh, multiple choice options. And I will just physically plug in 10 for X and 10 for Y. And if I do that, I would get zero, zero, 20. And I believe that this would be 90. And then that just let some common sense take over. We see that that horizontal tangent line certainly can't be choice C, cannot be choice D. You've got it really whittled down between A and B. So we can now go to another point. Now, if you still like this corner idea, corner points are probably pretty easy to find. They're very easy to distinguish, but sometimes they might do the job. Sometimes they may not do the job. So let's check 10, negative 10. Well, if we plug that in here, we get negative 10 minus 10, which is negative 20. And if we plug it into part B, 10 minus negative 10 is positive 20. We're wasting our time if we plug it in C and D. And I think you might have to look at this point. And sometimes uh, it may not be real clear. That looks like a pretty steep slope. Can you tell if it's positive? Can you tell if it's negative? Maybe, maybe not. If you have doubts about whether or not it's positive, and I believe it is, you can find another nice pattern happening here in the problem. Maybe if you go to, uh, I don't know, maybe the point, uh, how about two comma one, something like right along, uh, that that uh, uh, sort of a diagonal string of slope segments. So if I plug in two comma one, I can see that I would get one minus two, which is negative one there, but two minus one, which is positive one. And it's certainly true that that slope looks a lot more positive than it does negative. And so we're gonna go with option B. Problem number five uh, is a, Another differential equation problem that kind of sort of reaches into the logistic realm a little bit. Let's read this together. It says a hilarious meme about Brian and Tony is spreading among AP calculus students. We don't know how this started, but the number of students that have been, uh, that have seen this meme follows a logistic curve that's modeled by the function S of T where T is the time in days. The number of students that have seen the meme is increasing at a rate of 125 students uh, per day when S reaches half of the carrying capacity of 500 students. We're supposed to figure out which of the following would be the logistic differential equation for DS over DT. So as you can see, a lot of text in this problem, a lot of things to read, a lot of things to absorb. You also are gonna have to recall a very important relationship that we shared with you earlier about the logistic differential equation form, especially the derivative form. And there's typically two versions of it. There, there's one that looks a little bit like the left side and one that looks a little like the right side. Uh, they're, they're obviously equivalent to each other. They both contain this value L, like Brian said before, neither one will contain the independent variable uh, X or, or T, uh, whatever it may be. So what we're gonna be doing in this problem is try to isolate on some very important language. And that first important piece of language is this carrying capacity of 500. 
And we wanna make sure that we're able to identify that immediately as our L. It's no mistake that L is used in that particular formula because it also is what the word limit starts with. And that's indeed what a carrying capacity is. And so if you start looking at the choices, just the form, it seems like they more likely model the first version of this logistic differential equation. So we start looking at the L that's in the denominator of the second term. And if we don't see a 5,000 there, it's a no-go. We're gonna cross off both choices B and C. And so now we have it to a 50-50 shot. But in order to get this uh, distinguishing uh, between A and D all taken care of, we're gonna have to look a little bit deeper into the question. We're gonna have to start reading some of this other text like, the number of students that have seen the mean is increasing at a rate of 125 when S reaches half the carrying capacity. So essentially it's saying that the derivative, right? The rate is 125 when S is, well, half of the carrying capacity would be 2,500. And so what we're going to do is we're going to plug our 2,500 into both of the remaining equations and see which one is going to produce this answer of 125. And if we do that for part A, right off the bat, 1 tenth times 2,500, quantity one minus S again, 2,500 over 5,000, is gonna give us a simplified answer of, well, 2,500 over 10 is just, of course, 250. And then we would multiply that by one minus a half, right? And one minus a half, of course, is a half. And a half of 250 just happens to be that 125. And so pretty confident that A is the right answer. I won't walk you through why D is incorrect, but it seems like you're going to get a pretty large number right off the bat here with this 125 times that uh, S value of 2,500. And then finally, I'm gonna take a really quick look at number six here, AP level four. We're getting into the nitty gritty of solving differential equations here. And so the very first thing that we're going to do here is make sure that we separate these variables. That is paramount when you're trying to solve these equations. And so because we see that the dy is located on the left side, we're gonna keep him there and we're gonna divide both sides by y. And so we would come up with this result on the left side of the equation. We're gonna multiply both sides by x squared. And now we can say that we have a complete separation. Y is on the left, x is on the right. At this point, you can integrate both sides. A little trick is I always leave a little space there so I don't have to rewrite that equation just to put those integral symbols in. The antiderivative of one over y, of course, is natural log of absolute value of y. On the right side, very important that you do the math correctly, because I was, I was gonna see if, if anybody would have chimed in here to say, Mr. Record, you didn't do this right. And it's really easy to mess up the solution to a differential equation. Sometimes we don't focus so much on the algebra being nearly as important as the calculus. But in this particular case, I need to divide by x squared, not multiply by x squared. And even when you get here, you're not completely out of the woods. And the reason is because it's such a common mistake on the AP exam. I've graded many exams and I've seen this mistake done where students think that the natural log is just like freely the antiderivative of any kind of rational expression where one is the numerator. And so that is not the case here. One over X squared, if he was having a dream, he would be dreaming of being written as X to the negative two because people could probably take his derivative a lot easier and his integral a lot easier. And so we use the power rule and we would get X to the negative one over negative one plus our constant of integration. And then at this point, we can then start to maybe clean this up a little bit. And now, we normally would have an initial condition, but in this case, it doesn't seem like we're provided with that. And so we really have no other choice but to solve this as a general solution. Now you might say, well, there's no C values here. And you might also read this very carefully and that word could is so important. because so we're not saying that the solution that we're gonna find here is definitively the one and only, but it's 
a solution that could have worked provided we were given an initial condition. And so at this point, you're just going to exponentiate both sides, use E as a base. The E and the LN will sort of wipe each other out. You have the absolute value of Y is equal to E to the negative one over X plus C power. Please note that that plus C right now is in the exponents position. Now, this whole idea about when are we allowed to get rid of the absolute values? When do we have to be careful? Well, to be honest, we're, we're in a situation here where we're not quite sure, we're not quite sure what's happening. We don't have an initial condition per se. And so we're gonna go ahead and get rid of those absolute values. And we're gonna think about, okay, let's just stick with the idea that maybe our initial condition is gonna provide a, a positive Y. Let's use that philosophy first. Well, what we're going to see on the right side is just a really heavily used concept from perhaps your Algebra 2 class, and that this exponent can be split apart like that, e to the negative 1 over x times e to the c. And at that point, that e to the c can take on a whole new name as a new constant. Maybe I might call that constant now, maybe I'll call it c1. And this would be the form of my differential equation. I just don't know what the C1 is going to be. But as I can see, there's really only one option that looks like that. You would go with choice C. B is very tricky because B is a, as a, as a distractor that kind of might make kids think that they put that plus C in a slightly wrong spot. So you got to be really careful with those. Brian, why don't you take it over? Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're going to continue now with another question here, um, AP level four. Uh, and this is a question that it's one of those things where if you know what you're doing and what it's asking, it's really easy. And now that I said that out loud, Tony, I realize, uh, I guess everything is that way, right? If you know what you're doing, it seems pretty easy. But uh, a lot of the problems in the exam, and I've noticed this, you know, through my own students and through teaching over, over time, uh, is the kids don't know what the question is asking. And once I kind of break it down for them, they're like, oh, I could have done that. Why don't they just say that, right? And so um, a lot of this is just getting experience with recognizing the types of questions and the wording the exam does. And so all these problems that Tony and I are sharing, like we said, are, are, are brand new problems. They haven't been anywhere else, but they're all, you know, AP style, right? So we, we try to use the same kind of uh, wording and the same kind of problems the exam is going to use. The the, the things they're testing um, for and mistakes and the distractor answers are all going to be very similar to the exam to make sure you're getting the best experience possible. And this is a question that uh, comes up sometimes. And if you're not really sure what's asking, you might thinking it's really a hard question, but it's a really straightforward question uh, once you know the secret, right? And so uh, one of the uh, topics in the curriculum is uh, verifying or checking solutions. So we, we solve these problems quite a bit uh, by separating or integrating both sides. And sometimes it's they're giving us the solution. It's like a Jeopardy question, right? They're giving us the solution in advance and then they want the, which one of these equations would, would create this. And so um, there's no shortcut for this. You can't just solve it directly. Uh, so what we're gonna do is look at these four choices and figure out uh, how can I use the information given to me to start checking these off one by one. And, and notice every option uh, has a Y prime prime in it, and every option has a, uh, a Y of some kind in it. And they're trying to figure out which one of these equations would equal zero. And so uh, it might be good for us to just find Y prime prime first. We have Y, so we can plug that in pretty easily, but uh, let's find the second derivative of Y. And we're gonna do this by uh, taking Y prime first, the derivative, and uh, we're able to practice some of our AB skills here. We have an exponential function and uh, E to the two X's derivative is E to the two X, but we have to use the chain rule, right? So we have to multiply that by two, the derivative of the exponent. Uh, and then cosine's derivative is just minus sine of X. Uh, when we're dealing with sine and cosine, I always have my students write down uh, kind of vertically SC, negative S, negative C to help them remind them about derivative rules. Sine becomes cosine, cosine becomes negative sine, uh, and on and on. And if you're taking antiderivatives, uh, we would go up the ladder. If you're taking derivatives, we would go kind of down that ladder. Uh, it's a nice visual, so you don't make any mistakes on the high pressure exam. So, uh, so Y prime, we have this. We don't really need Y prime. We want Y prime prime. And uh, to get Y prime prime, we differentiate Y prime. I feel kind of bad for Y prime because we don't use him in the problem really. Uh, but we just use him to get to what you want, right? So uh, it doesn't really, it's like a middleman almost. Uh, so 2E, the 2X is derivative. Uh, if we use chain rule, it'll end up being 
for e to the two x. So e to the two x stays the same. We multiply by two and that two in front becomes a four. And then the minus sine of x becomes minus cosine of x. And so uh, now we have our y prime prime as well. And so now that we have y prime prime and we know what y is from the problem, we can sort of just plug them in and see which ones work. And so uh, a lot of times you do these problems, you might be thinking, well, it's take me forever to plug this into four different problems. But uh, what we do is we plug it into one of them, then you can really quickly tell uh, through you know trial and error, like what works and what didn't work. So you can easily eliminate choices pretty fast at that point. And so uh, Y prime prime, uh, they have in front, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check A first. I'm gonna write down A, we're gonna see if A worked. Uh, it becomes 4e to the 2x minus cosine of x, and then minus y. And so we have our y value here. And I'm going to put y in parentheses when we plug it in, because remember, we have to distribute that minus sign. That's always one of those common mistakes that we see a lot in the exam is students don't use parentheses when they're subtracting a quantity, and they forget to distribute it, like on the quotient rule, for example. Uh, and then plus 2 cosine of x. And we need this to equal zero. I'm gonna put zero question mark. That's what my son always says to me when he has a question. He'll just say the word question mark. Can I go to the store question mark? Uh, and then if we distribute this and kind of combine some stuff, what do we get? We get four e to the two x minus e to the two x. Uh, that's gonna be three e to the two x. We have a minus cosine, another minus cosine, and a plus two cosine. And we end up with this. And the cosines would cancel. Uh, but certainly 3e e to the 2x is not zero. So this can't be our solution. So instead of just going through one by one and checking every single one methodically, we can look at what we did here and think, why didn't this work, right? Um, when we had y prime prime here in front, that's e to the 2x didn't all cancel. We we had only one here and we needed you know to have none when we were done. And so uh, that's why we le were left with three of them. But what might have fixed that? Well, if we had this times four, 4e to the 2x, uh, the e to the 2x is what have canceled. And so as I'm going through this, it kind of makes part b a little bit promising because it does have this minus 4y component to it, doesn't it? And so we can try it out. And so if I look at b, we have our same y prime prime. So thankfully, we don't have to you know, recalculate that. We have our 4e to the 2x power uh, minus cosine. And this is the part of the show where you realize uh, my handwriting compared to Tony's handwriting is just embarrassingly terrible. Um, I wouldn't look so bad except for his handwriting is sold online as fonts that you can buy for your Word and other programs. And my handwriting is uh, just mocked, but it's okay. Uh, we have this minus and it's four Y. So I'm gonna put a four in front this time. And we're gonna see if this one pans out any better. And uh, now that I'm handwriting conscious about what I'm writing on the screen, uh, I'm going to hopefully do a little bit better of a job. And we're going to maybe say, does this question mark not, not equal? Does this equal zero? Well, let's find out. Uh, if we distribute the minus four here, uh, this becomes minus four e to the two x. And that's a good thing because we know they're going to cancel, right? And we're going to have a minus four cosine of x as well uh, when that's distributed. So when we try to combine like terms, the four e to the two x's do cancel out, which is great. But what's going to happen with the cosines now that we multiply it by four? Well, this one right here, uh, becomes what? It becomes minus cosine uh, and then minus four cosine and then plus two cosine. And I was realizing now on part B, that wasn't a two cosine in front. It was a five or three cosine in front. So uh, I caught myself here. Uh, that would be a three in front. Uh, it doesn't really make much of a difference, unfortunately, because either way we've uh, not reach what we're looking for, because although the e to the four, two x is cancel, uh, we're going to be left with a negative two cosine of x, unfortunately, and that does not equal zero. So we, we fixed one problem and created another problem. And as we're looking through the other choices, uh, multiplying the first one by four seems like a terrible idea. They give us 16, which would be a really, really rough way. Uh, but maybe this last one is more promising because notice uh, it has this plus five cosine of x at the end instead of the plus three, but everything else was the same as part B. So the beginning part was the same. We would have this 4e to the 2x minus cosine of x still, and we would have the minus 4e to the 2x minus four cosine of x 
that would be our first two pieces that we got from uh, the first two terms. But instead of a plus three cosine, it'd be a plus five cosine. And uh, this is already looking a lot more promising. Uh, hopefully you uh, are already seeing kind of the patterns. And so when they have these, don't be you know, thinking it's gonna be a billion hours of work. It's just gonna be, you recognize patterns and kind of quickly check the other answers. And, and what do we see? The cosines in fact do cancel and zero does equal zero uh, and it's part D. Right, it's kind of just mean to have the right answer in part D, isn't it? Because you have to go, go through each one and check them, and then you go through A, B, C, they don't work, and you go all the way to D before you find one that works. So, uh, let's take a look at question number eight, and uh, this is about meerkats. It's a lot of nice little story problem, and the population of meerkats uh, will grow according to this logistic differential equation. And if they mention the word logistic in the problem, you should definitely take note of that because uh, it means it's going to be our logistic formulas. And we want to figure out which of these statements are true. The logistic equation, like the solution, is a pretty kind of complicated process. And uh, to get to that solution, it's pretty challenging. Uh, thankfully, the BC exam uh, does not make you solve a logistic differential equation. When you see one, uh, it's going to be really come down to just understanding the properties. Like it's more of a conceptual idea. And once you have a logistic differential equation, uh, you know how things are going to work, how it's going to grow and then, uh, you know, be increasing or be concave up, concave down. And they ask them the very same problems over and over again. And this is a good example. So we have three options to choose from. Uh, if M is greater than 300, the population is decreasing. The rate uh, that it's growing is the greatest rate when M is 150. And then the limit of M uh, as T approaches infinity is going to be 300. So uh, I went ahead and copied on the screen here, a uh, differential equation, it's a logistic uh, form again, right? It doesn't quite apply in this problem in terms of the same lettering, but it certainly is uh, the same idea. Uh, and we're gonna kind of rewrite this. So notice when we have it in this form, it's really easy to to understand what the carrying capacity is and what else is going on, but uh, we don't quite have it in that form here. We have this 3m minus 0.01m squared. So the first thing we want to do, if it's not already in a nice logistic form that we can identify information from, is uh, let's factor out this, this number here, this y variable in front, so we get a 1 minus here inside the parentheses. And we can do that pretty quickly. Uh, by factoring out this 3m. So I'm going to write this as let's factor out the 3m and we have a one left minus and then we got to figure out what is going on with this right. So 0.01m squared is 1 over 100 right it's 100 times m squared and we're trying to factor a 3 out of something that doesn't even have a 3 but we're dividing by 3 essentially. So uh, what we end up getting is going to be m over 300. So that's some, some algebra for the win. My cat keeps trying to jump onto my, my screen, Tony. I have a little kitten who's just as uh, adorable and loving, and she wants to come up and, and snuggle with me, but she doesn't understand it's not the right time. So you see my arm jumping on the side. It's it's me uh, begrudgingly trying to hold my cat back from making an appearance on, on TV. She's kind of a diva. So is that was that a cat or a meerkat though? <laughs> I think she the saw the meerkat and she's and she's a little bit jealous of, of the attention the meerkat's getting. So she's making sure I know that she knows that I am uh, seeing other cats uh, and, and talking about how cute other cats are. She doesn't appreciate that. So, uh, so here we go. We've got this differential equation now. It's in the right form. And once we have this, logistics are pretty easy to work with because uh, we have very basic properties. And um, I'm going to bring up this little picture that Tony had on the beginning slide, this little graphic. And there's two different graphs. And a differential equation has one solution. There aren't more than one solution. So the two graphs are not like one solution. It's just showing that uh, most logistics that you see are like this bottom one, right? It looks kind of like this where it's, uh, you know, excellency growing and then it has a carrying capacity. So it kind of, you know, hinders the growth of the end and it approaches this limiting value. But uh, the top one is what happens if you started with more than the carrying capacity. Like if you start above the carrying capacity, you're kind of losing value and approaching it. And so this is what's happening with question number one. We see a room number one. It says if M is greater than 300, the population is decreasing. And we're thinking, well, we just were thinking that, you know, logistics only increase. Well, the ones we work with typically do, unless we start with a value above the carrying capacity. And we can see from the problem, uh, our carrying capacity was 300, right? It's our limiting factor. And so if we start with more than that, it must be decreasing because it's always approaching 300. So this is actually a true statement. Uh, if you start above 300, it will decrease toward it.
And then we also know a really important property that comes up all the time with these is going to be this idea of um, every logistic problem is growing the fastest at its halfway point. And so we saw that in the other problem as well that Tony did with the meme, and we see it here. So if the carrying capacity is 300, uh, it will grow the fastest when it's half of 300, uh, which is 150. So this is also going to be a true statement. And then the Roman numeral three is just a, a limit as t goes to infinity uh, of our value m. This is a fancy way of asking for what is the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is going to be what value do you approach as your time increases without bound. And so as time goes on and on and on, uh, it will approach 300 because that is our carrying capacity. And all three of those are correct, which means choice D is our is our option. Now, I do want to give credit for this picture because uh, Tony uh, took this picture himself, and this is at the Indianapolis Zoo uh, nearby both of our homes, and they have adorable cats. If you have a, a zoo nearby, uh, definitely go and check out the meerkats because they're, they're pretty adorable. Uh, and we had to get at least one picture in uh, during this video. So great picture, Tony. I don't know what the meerkat's doing. It's like saying, like, don't talk to the hand. Like, it's like a 1980s like, TV show. Like, talk to the hand, turns the head away. Uh, it's a diva meerkat. So uh, I enjoyed it. So uh, one more multiple choice question. And then Tony's going to kick us off on our free response problem. And I just wanted to show this problem because we're going to be looking at Euler's method. And Tony showed you one method. And I would like to show uh, an alternative method because uh, you might have seen it different ways. And, and we've noticed that when we show problems a certain way on here, if it's a little bit different than how your teacher you know, showed it or, or taught you how to do it, sometimes students will think, oh, you know, I must have learned it wrong. And, and you didn't, right? Uh, but there's different ways of doing it. And we want to show those different ways. And uh, hopefully you find one that works uh, really well for you. So uh, another method is to use a table uh, to kind of store your values. And we're kind of using this equation that Tony, you know, obviously, um, same idea with the tangent line idea. Is it really a tangent line equation that uh, the next value in the y coordinate is going to be your starting y value plus h, which is our step size, times uh, the derivative uh, at our value. And so um, an n is what step you're on. Um, so it's a very similar idea. It's just kind of a different way of organizing it. If you're going to use a table, make sure you label everything and show your work, right? Because if you don't show things that are labeled and you make any mistakes at all, we can't give you any credit for your process because we don't know what these values are. Um, you can't get process credit for Euler's method if uh, you don't have things labeled or your work shown. So uh, we want to make sure we uh, label things well and, and show our work in a nice organized way. Uh, so here we have an F prime in our table, and then we have Euler's method uh, starting at four, and we're doing two steps. With Euler's, always figure out how many steps you're going to be using uh, and what you're approximating. So we want to end up finding F of three, and we're starting when X is four, and luckily we have our, our starting point. And so uh, when N is zero, it's our starting location. That's going to be four comma one. That's our starting point. If I want to find the next value, if I want to find, you know, Y sub one or you might call it y sub two, however you want to label it, but I'm going to call it one because of I started with zero here. Uh, it's going to be our initial y value plus our step size. And so think about your step size. We're starting at four, and we want to end up at three at the end, right? We're going to have x is going to be three for sure. Uh, we also can figure out pretty quickly that our x value here in between is 3.5, but our step size is not the x value. Our step size is going to be you know, what we're changing our x values each time, and, and we're going down, going backwards a half, right? To go from four to 3.5 to three. And so our, our H value here is actually going to be uh, negative one half, right? So I'm going to make this a, a subtraction sign here. And just because I don't want to try to highlight over this, I'm going to go ahead and change it uh, to a minus sign, not try to scribble on it. One half, and then we multiply that by the derivative at our value. And most problems have an x and a y or dy dx as some equation like we've seen, differential equations. But uh, our dy dx is just very simply given to us, right? We don't have to overthink it. Uh, f prime when x is 4 is simply 6. I can just grab that because I don't need to plug it in anything. And uh, our y sub 0, right, was what? It was 1 in this case. So we get 1 minus 3 is our y1, which is just negative 2. So our, our intermediate step, kind of like Tony showed after one iteration, uh, would have given us negative 2. And then if I want to figure out what our second value is, our y sub 2, our final value, uh, we have our starting amount, which is negative 2. It's our current y value. And we still have the same step size. h is still going to be negative 1 half. But now I have to find the derivative right at 3.5. I have to be careful that I grab this value from the table because uh, you're doing it at your current 
point. So x was 3.5 and our f prime there is going to be five. And that means that our y2 value is going to be negative two minus two and a half, which is negative four and a half. And that is going to be our our final value. And if you're doing a multiple free response problem, you definitely want to, uh, you know, reiterate what your answer is that you realize that is the answer. So f of three is approximately negative 4.5. We obviously didn't need that statement on a multiple choice problem, but it's good practice. So uh, here we have b negative 4.5. Now, Tony is going to lead us through a couple parts of a FRQ involving uh, some differential equation ideas, and I'll kind of end it with one other part, part C, and then uh, we will wrap it up today. So, Tony, what do we got? Sounds great. And this is the world premiere of our first free response practice question. Again, you can always find these in the packet. You'll notice that it's a four-part question, and I'm going to, as Brian said, take a look at parts A and B. It's got a very short stem. It says, consider the differential equation dy over dx as x squared minus 4y. Let y equal f of x be the solution to the differential equation with the initial condition f of 2 equal 1. And that's all we get. We can address four very interesting problems that really kind of span a wide breadth of calculus. Now, part A is going to ask us to, on the axis provided to sketch a slope field at the six points that they indicate. And uh, we've seen slope field problems a moment ago in the multiple choice. This is kind of a moving in the opposite direction. You're gonna generate the slope field. And generally speaking, if you can avoid an arithmetic mistake, you're probably gonna be in pretty good shape here. And so you would just take the points that I have already listed in a table. You don't have to necessarily uh, use a table. Uh, it's there for you if, if you want to put it together. And you would systematically plug these points into the derivative because the derivative is going to produce the slope segments. So when x is 1 and y is, I'm sorry, when x is 0 and y is, is positive 1, I'm going to start here in the upper left corner, we're going to get a value of negative 4. When x is 0 and y is 0, we have obviously 0. When x is 0 and y is negative 1, this is where you've got to be a little bit more careful when you run into some negative values. So 0 minus 4 times negative 1 will be a positive 4. Now, notice that you don't need to use x values of 1. It's really not something that they're going to score. So you want to skip over those and use only the points that they ask. And double check and make sure that they align to the number of points that they suggested. So at 2, 1, x is 2 y is 1, so 4 minus 4 looks like that's going to be 0. x is 2 and y is 0 is 4 minus 0, which is 4. And then finally, the one that's probably the trickiest here, 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times negative 1 is actually 4 plus 4, which is 8. And now you'll move over to your graph, and you're just going to construct little tiny line segments that would adhere to these slopes. Now, you're not allowed to use a straight edge on the AP exam, but there might be some materials that you are allowed to use around you, like, say, an eraser is a really valuable tool sometimes if you want to sketch little slope segments. So at this point, we want to sketch the slope of negative 4. You might have to, oh, cheat a little bit. Think about going down 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, two more points that aren't even there over one, and he's kind of your target. And so you want to try to move towards him. You know that's a fairly steep negative slope nonetheless. At the point zero, zero, you've got a nice little horizontal slope of uh, a horizontal segment that's going to have that zero slope. At zero, negative one, a slope of four. So we're going to go up one, two, three, four over one. He's our target. I'm going to go after him. And now I have half of them taken care of. 2, 1, we have another 0 slope. At 2, 0, the slope of 4, up 1, up 2, up 3, maybe over another 1, 2, 3, and 4, and over 1. It's going to be pretty steep, maybe heading off in that direction. Somewhat parallel to him would be nice to compare to. And then this guy is really steep. Boy, he's, he's going like whole hog. He's going to have a slope of 8. And so it's kind of ridiculous to try to count up what would be eight blocks, but generally speaking, if you just kind of make that slope look like it's even more steep than the one that you've got there, you're going to be in pretty good shape. A lot of the times on the AP exam, we're just going to look for slopes that are positive versus slopes that are negative versus slopes that are horizontal. 
But when you can, we really want you to try to make those slopes have the same relative steepness to the value that they're taking on. But it's an easy way to get a, a one or maybe even a couple of points on your AP exam FRQ. And then lastly, with uh, the part that I'm going to show you here uh, with uh, part B, uh, you're going to see a nice throwback to an earlier part of your calculus course. Let k of x equal f of x minus 3x plus 6. Does k have a local minimum, local maximum, or neither at x equal 2? Justify your answer. And so you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with differential equations? Well, it's a very ingenious way that Brian was able to kind of lure in the differential equation in order to answer these relative extreme problems. So if we think about what does it mean for k to have a local minimum at the point two, well, we know that that ties back to the value of the derivative. Right? Think back, when a derivative was positive, that meant that we, we, we had uh, an increasing type of curve, and, and when the derivative was negative, we had a decreasing type of curve. And so we, we end up having this really wonderful relationship between the sign of the derivative and the value that uh, uh, we're going to be taking on and the behavior of the curve. And so let's first of all find k prime. So we take k prime and that derivative would just simply be, well, that would be f prime of x, right? Taking the derivative of f and then the derivative of minus three x would of course be minus three. And then your derivative of six is obviously nothing. And so now we're thinking about, okay, where do we go to uh, at this point? Well, we're supposed to evaluate this at two and then find out, you know, we've got going on here. And so k prime of two would be the same as f prime of two minus our three. All right, well, now we're kind of in a kind of a sticky situation because we got to figure out what this value of f prime is. And we don't really see anything explicitly related to f prime. But because we know that y equal f of x is the solution to this differential equation, that sort of links f of x and dy dx together. And so they are going to be, uh, I'm sorry, the dy dx and the f prime of x, I should say, are linked together. Yeah, we need that prime mark. That's very important. All right. And so this f prime that we have here is going to be basically evaluated using what we have up here, but it's still awfully tricky because yes, x is equal to two, not a problem, two squared, but the four y is very tricky. And boy, if there was anybody that was able to find a way to mess this up, it would be me. And so the value of y when x is two is going to be located down here. And so you're going to have to use him in this particular case. And then of course you have a, subtraction of three here. And then when we do the rest of the, the arithmetic, four minus four minus three, of course, is negative three. And so the value of the derivative at two, well, wait a minute, it's equaling negative three. Specifically at two, we got a negative value. Well, wait a minute, in order to have a local max or a local min, What's going to have to happen is that the derivative value is going to have to equal zero because that is the first criteria. You have to be a critical number in order to be a candidate for a, a local min or a local max. And because we don't have that zero here, we are going to say that we have neither. And it's nice if you want to write out a little bit uh, that uh, at, at x equal two, there is neither a min or a max. But by, by and large, this work here will satisfy your justify. A lot of times you don't have to use words to justify. And if you predominantly feature that word neither circled or uncircled, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So it's a great problem. And I'm going to tell you what, Brian's getting ready to take over the most favorite part of this problem, in my opinion, part C. Brian, what does it look like? Thanks, Tony. Just a warning to the students, if you're watching us uh, over the next, you know, six, seven days as you're here for the exam. And Tony and I say it's our favorite problem. That's usually a sign that our students uh, may not agree with us so much on, on those things. Uh, we find beauty in problems and sometimes students find them uh, 
headache worthy. So uh, part C of this question uh, is going to say, find the value of this limit, right? So what the heck is going on now? We have a limit showing up out of nowhere. Uh, and I'm not going to try to read that out loud because I'll just mess it up. But uh, it's, you know, some stuff is going on. Uh, so find the value or state it does not exist and justify your answer. So, you know, when I see a limit on the AP exam, especially for response, um, and hopefully you do the same thing, your first instinct really should be to think L'Hopital's theorem. Right, because uh, if you plug it in and you get zero on top and zero on bottom, some kind of indeterminate form, uh, we can apply L'Hopital's rule. And they don't always do that. Don't just apply the theorem without checking the conditions first, because if it was not necessary, you would get the wrong answer, right? But here, uh, it's always our first step is just you know evaluate the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator separately. And we want we have to do this using L'Hopital's theorem, and uh, we got to be careful with notation. This is definitely one of those types of problems where uh, if we don't uh, you know show some good notation and some good form we're going to lose uh, some easy points and so uh, what we need to do on these problems is uh, kind of write out or show the limit of the numerator by itself and then find the limit of the denominator by itself we don't want to say equals zero over zero that's not really a, a real thing and that notation will, will most likely cost you uh, earning all the points and so uh, i want to try to plug four into the top and i realize if i plug four into the top i get three e 12 minus two times four uh, that's e to the fourth and I plug four into this integral. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen that before, right? When you see like an integral sign in a limit, you're like, okay, this is not what I signed up for. Uh, but we can evaluate this uh, integral. We did this in the last session. Session one of this review series, we did uh, integration techniques. And this is just an integration by parts problem. And I even wrote the reminder that uh, u times v prime, the integral of that is uv minus the integral of v du. And uh, a problem like this, that uh, would make sense to probably make u b t. And then we're going to make v prime be e to the t dt. And when we go to find u prime, t's derivative would just be one dt and v prime it's kind of actually not that bad once you jump into it because the antiderivative of e to the t is just e to the t so it actually worked out pretty nice and so using our formula if i wanted to figure out okay what is the uh integral of of t e to the t dt power well it's going to be u times v so we're going to have uh t times e to the t power. That's our, our u and v here. And then minus the antiderivative of what? Of v times u prime. And u prime is 1. And it's just going to be something like this, right? And it's a little bit kind of different with the notation because we kind of have you know an evaluation bar on the first piece. We've, we've taken the antiderivative and we have 1 to 4. And it might have been better for me in the, in the moment not to even include the limits, just do the, uh, the indefinite integral first and then use that answer. But I kind of was already halfway into it. So we're going to continue this. And uh, we end up getting t e to the t. This is our first term. And then minus the integral of e to the t is just e to the t. And we can just now evaluate this all at once, can't we? Plug in 4 for t, and we get 4e to the t. I guess e to the 4, if we plug in 4 to both, minus e to the 4th. And then I'm going to subtract. And I'm going to put in this quantity of, you know, if t is 1, we just get e to the t, or e to the 1, minus e to the 1. And those are going to be 0. They're going to cancel. And uh, we end up just getting, in our final answer, uh, just 3e to the 4th. And so here we get 3e to the 4th, a lot of side work, right? Minus 3e to the 4th. And all of that equals 0, which we actually need for L'Hopital's theorem. And, and it, it seems like a lot of work, but uh, rest assured, if you have a, a lot of side work on your quest to do these problems, they're definitely going to uh, have a lot of points tied to it for that for that effort, right? And then the, the other limit here, uh, f of x over 2 minus 2x plus 7, that's going to be uh, f of 2, if you plug in 4 for x, minus 8 plus 7. And f of 2, thankfully, the problem told us is 1. And if we do this, what do we get? Well, we just get plus 7, hopefully. We also get 0. And so we get 0 in the numerator, 0 in the denominator. And we're able to then use L'Hopital's theorem. And uh, I've kind of walked myself into a corner here in terms of spacing, right? This is why Tony's uh, perfect handwriting usually serves him well. I don't want to crowd the screen too much. So I'm just going to change the color here uh, in order to distinguish it because uh, it's all kind of cramped on one screen. But uh, by L'Hopital's theorem, uh, we're now able to just differentiate the numerator 
and the denominator. So we get what for the numerator? We're going to get uh, 3e to the 12 minus 2x. If I differentiate that, uh, we're going to get 3. And then the e is not going to change, is it, right? It's going to be the 12 minus 2x still in the exponent. But we have to multiply because the chain rule by negative 2x is derivative. And that ends up giving us a negative 6 in the front because we have it times negative two, there's already a three there. And then we're going to do the second part and uh, hopefully you don't mind. I need to erase some of this. Uh, please do not do that on the AP exam. Uh, when you have your work, uh, do not erase it uh, unless it's a totally wrong, in which case you should probably just cross it out instead. But uh, I'm doing it because I wanna be able to write down something. Uh, and then uh, we get this with the derivative. And then what do we have on here? We have this uh, integral, definite integral, we have to differentiate it. That's the second fundamental theorem. And so uh, that just ends up being uh, x e to the x power, right? Using the second fundamental theorem, we just plug in this upper value uh, and then we can write all of that over the bottoms derivative uh, using L'Hopital. It's f prime of x over two uh, times one half, doing the chain rule, uh, minus two. So we've applied L'Hopital's theorem and now we're finally able uh, to plug in our value four again. So we have negative six e to the fourth again, minus four, because x is four, e to the fourth, all over one half f prime of two minus two. So our numerator becomes negative 10 e to the fourth, right? Combine those. And then f prime of two, well, we have our, our derivative up here. So if you plug in two to that, uh, f prime of two, a little side work is gonna be two squared minus four times one. Remember y is one, that gives us zero for f prime of two. And we end up getting just this, which is a final answer if we reduce is five e to the fourth. And that is the longest winding limit problem you've probably ever seen or want to see in your life. And it really does combine a lot of things from L'Hopital's theorem to uh, fundamental theorem to derivative rules to uh, everything in between. So um, if you enjoyed that problem, we also have a part D that you can check out online as well. Uh, our big takeaways, uh, and I'll let you kind of look at these, but uh, different equations could be in context, be ready for that. Don't always have X's and Y's. For logistics, you're not going to solve them. But you should know the properties. That beginning uh, graphic that Tony had in the beginning is a great thing to look at. That's on the student handout if you check uh, in the uh, the drive folder. And then make sure you understand all those properties of logistics. And uh, just one more time, in case you didn't see it in the beginning, uh, this URL and this or this QR code will get you to these handouts, where we have many, many more. Uh, handouts and just this one actually. So, uh, and many, many more problems besides the ones we've seen. Long-winded, I apologize, but uh, you guys stuck with us. You got to see my cat and a meerkat and you got to do some problems with Tony and I, and uh, hopefully you're feeling better about the exam because it's you know a couple weeks away. Uh, tomorrow, Tony, we're gonna be doing uh, some more topics. I believe some Taylor polynomials, uh, getting into some serious stuff. It's gonna be pretty serious. Uh, we can tell some good you know dad jokes and math jokes. So. Uh, Take us away, Tony. What, what do we have to hey, be thankful for? I know we went pretty quick today, but we know that you're up for the challenge. You're BC students. You're among the best math students in the entire country, in the entire world at your age. And uh, we, we are your biggest cheerleaders. So we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, keep studying.